Our next featured speaker is Dr. April Wright, and we are really happy to have her here. She's currently the Assistant Professor of Biological Science at Southeastern Louisiana University. Dr. Wright has several currently funded projects in the lab on deep time evolutionary dynamics in a variety of groups of organisms. Secondary focus in the Wright lab is domain-based education research in computational biology and how biology undergraduate students learn computation and mathematics. Dr. Wright, I can't wait to hear what a Bayesian model is and the latest fashions they're wearing. Oh, that probably isn't the right kind of model, right? I'll stop guessing and let you go on. <laughs> go right ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, really happy to be here today. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, put this into slideshow mode and see if you can still see me advancing. All right. Can you guys see me advance my slide or are you still seeing the title? I can and we can hear you just fine. Everything's good. Perfect. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really nice to be here today. Uh, so today, I'm a little bit of a different type of scientist than um, your other past couple of speakers. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some of the mathematical modeling that we do in the lab. Uh, there actually won't be any genomic data um, in this particular talk. Uh, and instead we'll be focusing on what we do with models and, and how we can do that confidently. I just realized I have the wrong year uh, in, my, in my slide. It is not 2021. But it's been, it feels like it's been a lot of years lately. So that's fine. Like I said, I'm a little bit of a different biologist than um, the other speakers in this session. I don't really do very much in the way of genomics. Um, and in this lab, we predominantly work on complex and particularly hierarchical models for estimating phylogenetic trees, particularly from the integration of a variety of data sources. Uh, and Ilya had asked me a little bit to talk about how I ended up interested in something like this. Uh, and I didn't start interested in uh, phylogenetics at all, in fact. Um, so when I went to college, I started taking intro bio classes uh, and I was really bored by that. Um, you know, you, you memorize the Krebs cycle and, and you know, you have to know all this stuff. And so I was, I was bored by that. Um, and I ended up dropping the biology major and picking up a journalism major actually. Um, but being the only person on, uh, staff who had any sort of, uh, STEM background at the newspaper, uh, I got handed a lot of science articles. And this was back in 2006 when a lot of the challenges to teaching evolution started to happen. Uh, so for example, uh, the Dover v. Kitzmiller trial and things like this. Uh, and so it was a really interesting time to be, uh, writing about and thinking about evolutionary biology. Uh, and because of that, I actually realized that biology wasn't just memorizing a bunch of stuff and regurgitating it onto an exam. Uh, it was a living discipline. Uh, and I became interested in the, uh, um, you know, the role of phylogenetics as sort of something that would allow you to study a little bit of everything, right? So you can build a phylogeny of fish, you can build a phylogeny of mammals. We work on ants in this lab, we work on stem mammals in this lab, we work on things that have been extinct for 500 million years, we work on things that you could walk out your front door and collect on your doorstep. So um, I got interested in phylogenetics because it was this uh, way to get to do everything a little bit at once, as well as a way to sort of uh, engage with the deeper philosophy of biology. Um, and when Ely and I had a conversation about this as well, um, uh, he wanted me to talk a little bit about primarily undergraduate institutions. Um, so when I went to college, I went to an undergraduate only institution, St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, and I decided that I really liked sort of that modality of education. Uh, and I decided to pursue it following uh, my PhD. So I've been here at Southeastern Louisiana University. Uh, this is the start of my sixth year. I was awarded tenure last year. Uh, and so I feel like the balance of responsibilities that I have in this type of lab is very good. I teach three courses a semester. I have a couple of master's students and typically four to six undergrads in, in my lab. Uh, and the work that you're about to see has been sort of touched on by all all of those personnel at at least some points. All right, so what we have here are two phylogenies. In panel A, this is a phylogenetic tree that is what we refer to as not scaled to time. So in this case, 
typically you're going to see a tree like this. You saw some in the previous presentation where the, uh, the branch lengths are usually given in a rate, right? The number of substitutions expected per site. So a measure of, you know, either the genetic or the morphological change, whatever you happen to use for your data. On the right-hand side is a phylogeny that has been scaled to time or what we might call absolute or geological time. These types of trees allow you to make, like I said, absolute or geological statements about when lineages diverged. Did they diverge 10 million years ago, 5 million years ago, 100 million years ago? These are the types of questions that we can answer with a time-scaled tree. And over the next couple of slides, I'll show you a couple of applications of these types of um, uh, phylogenies in the literature. So for example, right now, we might all be very familiar with this. This is a screen grab from the website NextStrain, where uh, you know, they're tracking different variants of COVID, right? And you can see there's a time axis on the x-axis of this. Uh, they're keeping track in absolute and real time of what strains are arising and how they're diversifying. You can see the different strains are in different colors here with some of them labeled um, by sort of their common uh, name. And you can see over time, some of them sort of go extinct. Some of them uh, continue and diversify. So for example, Omicron right now is sort of the dominant strain. Uh, you can see that dominance kind of over here on the, on the right-hand side of the phylogeny. So this is an example of a time-scaled phylogenetic tree. Uh, and another example here, this is an example from Scallops where they've built uh, you know, a phylogenetic tree of scallops. And what they're looking at is, um, if you've never looking, looked closely at a living scallop, they're bizarre. Um, they have a bunch of eyes on them. Uh, you can see by the scale down at your left, um, the eye abundance goes from, you know, black is like 37 eyes up to 151 eyes in the blue there. And then on the uh, kind of right facing phylogeny, phylogeny B, we have the life habits. So are they abyssal? Do they sit on, on the ground? Do they really attach to the ground? So cementing, do they free live? Do they glide? Do they do other things? Uh, and so this is the study, this is the study of trait evolution. How does the evolution of the eye impact the evolution of life history? And these types of studies typically also assume um, a uh, branch length in sort of millions of years. So absolute or geological time. And so how do we get a phylogeny with branch lengths in millions of years of time? And that is sort of the real question. Uh, the family of methods that I refer or that I work with are referred to as the fossilized birth death model. Uh, and it has three different phylogenetic components. For this reason, it's been sometimes referred to as the tripartite model or the tripartite approach. So under this model, we have our data. So our phylogenetic characters, these could be morphological characters, these could be DNA characters, and we have our fossil ages. And fossil is a little bit of a general term. If you're working with actual organisms that might fossilize, then yes, you have fossils. If you're working with viral data, uh, these would just be the ages of the thing that you isolated. So if you did a blood draw and you found that somebody uh, was carrying HIV and you wrote down the date, that would be your fossil age. And this model has three different components. There's the substitution model, so how your phylogenetic characters evolve, the clock model, which describes the um, distribution of evolutionary rates over time, and the tree and tree models. And this describes the process of diversification that generates your actual phylogeny. And what I mean by that is this. Uh, this part of the model is referred to as the fossilized birth death. What we have in the middle here is this character T that represents the phylogeny. And you can see there are five different parameters that are all pointing towards the phylogeny. These are the parameters that govern the tree shape, how many branches are on the tree, so how many lineages are on the tree, the age of the tree. We're going to walk through them. So right here we have the origin time. When did the process of diversification that leads to your observed tree start in your group? The speciation rate is what is the rate at which new lineages are added to the phylogeny? 
The extinction rate is the rate at which they are removed. The fossilization is rate is the rate at which we recover lineages in the past. So this could be via you know sampling viral um, loads. This could be the rate at which fossilization occurs in your group. And then the sampling probability of the things that currently exist in your group. How many of them have we sampled? Right. This is uh, you'll notice that this probability, the sampling probability is in a square that refers to this parameter being fixed. We typically assume in this model uh, that you know how many um, of your clade of interest you've sampled. So if you have um, your estimating phylogeny of bears, there is genetic data out there for every bear. You can include every bear in your sample. And so your sampling probability would be one. For many groups, you probably haven't sampled everything, but you might have some good idea of what proportion of the extant diversity you've sampled. And different tree shapes are going to uh, imply, or sorry, different model parameters are going to imply different tree shapes. Uh, so for example, if we are um, not including, you know, any um, tip sampling at all, that would sort of imply that we are going to sample absolutely everything. As we, you know, increase or um, as we increase our extinction rate, that impacts the tree that we're going that exists in reality, and it impacts the tree that we can recover from our data. Okay, continue on there, All right? So I think a lot of us are fairly familiar with Bayes' theorem. We have that right here. We have the posterior probability on the left-hand side of the equation, which is kind of the probability of parameters given data and a model. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the likelihood, so the probability of the data given your parameters in a model, any priors you have, right? Prior distri um, probability distributions that specify, uh, you know, knowledge that you have about those parameters. And that's all divided by the marginal probability of the data, which is sort of a complicated uh, quantity to get a handle on. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it here, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So in the case of the fossilized birth death, in a phylogenetic context, that equation looks something like this. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on the screen. Uh, so this is, this is a little bit tricky uh, to deal with. And so we're gonna take a look at how we can sort of break this down usefully uh, to do good model selection for each of our three hierarchical submodels. And I'm actually gonna present to you um, uh, some results that we have from, actually an entirely paleontological data set called uh, the Sinktons. Uh, these are an extremely temporally restricted uh, group of organisms, these are, uh, invertebrates, marine invertebrates. Um, and they're found basically from about 500 um, and 10 million years ago to about 498 million years ago. And that's it. Um, so these have a pretty good amount of phylogenetic characters for a small invertebrate, about 60 characters for those 27 taxa. Um, and something that's interesting is that we have some idea about how diverse they were over time. Um, so I'm gonna call your attention to panel uh, C on this one, where basically between the first two points, this one down at the origin, and then this one over here at um, about six million years, there's a huge jump in what we call the disparity, and that's an index of how different organisms are from one another. And so very early in this group, we accumulate a lot of uh, morphological change. Things begin to look very different, very fast. And so that's a very common pattern in the fossil record, sometimes referred to as the early burst. And so this might imply something about our distribution of evolutionary rates. In fact, it might imply that they are very quick at first, and then they slow over time. And so we decided to test four different molecular clocks. The strict clock says the rates of evolution are the same all across the tree, all through time. Probably not true in our case. The autocorrelated clock says, well, the rates of an ancestor are going to be similar to the rates of its descendants. Okay, that seems plausible. Early burst, like I just said, it kind of looks like our data is that. And then the uncorrelated means an ancestor and a descendant can have strongly different rates of evolution, no limits, sky's the limit, do whatever you want. All right, so again, that's sort of a, this is a visual representation of that where you can see on you know the autocorrelated, generally 
uh, the cooler colors are the low rates. And generally, you have to kind of pass through intermediate rates to go from low rates to high rates. On the uncorrelated clock there, you can see when the branches are colored by uh, evolutionary rate that you can have jumping from very low evolutionary rates to very high ones, no problem. All right, so we had a look at those. Um, and something that's also the case here is that we have pretty good geological information about the time period when these guys existed. Uh, so for example, we had pretty rapid um, accumulation of lineages here in stage five and then slower lineage accumulations in these stages. And so, um, you know, while we might expect evolutionary rates to change over time, this could potentially also be implicating the process of diversification over time. Perhaps it's that we're diversifying very rapidly early on and therefore accumulating disparity. So perhaps it's not the rate of evolution, but the rate of diversification. And so we took a little bit of a look at this and got some overall estimates from extinction rates and origination rates or speciation rates. Uh, and this allowed us to just sort of have some idea of ballparks for these sorts of models. So we're able to use these to place informative prior distributions on each of these values. And we use a set of models that are referred to as skyline models, which allow us to have a different kind of diversification process for each of our time periods. So we had a look at dividing up the time period into two chunks, uh, but also three chunks. So each of these individual stages getting its own diversification process. So we're not totally out to lunch on at least two of our models, right? Uh, but what about this part here? Uh, so most of the time we're gonna be working with the MK model of Paul Lewis, uh, and that's pretty much what we did in this paper. I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm just gonna keep moving. Um, we also looked at, you know, if uh, feeding and non-feeding characters evolve differently. So from kind of an infinite set of models that we could have assembled from all of those parameters, we were able to distill down to about 10, which is great. Um, we used a constant data set of fossil and phylogenetic characters. We did all of our estimation in a model or in a software called RevPhase, which is something that my lab works on for development. And this allows us to calculate a precise model likelihood to make comparisons between models. And what we found is that for each um, of the hierarchical subcomponents, there was one clear model that was best. All right, so for each, we could fit um, a best fit model uh, and use that to infer our phylogeny. So our um, uncorrelated log normal model was the best for the clock, which I was a little bit surprised by. And uh, a model in which we have diversification changing per stage was also good, All right? Um, and so this is computationally expensive, but we were able to get things to work a little bit better by not evaluating every single model and instead choosing models that have some prior evidence for them, All right? And so when you have these types of extremely complex models that really uh, calls for a return to hypothesis-driven work, right? Why do we think this is the right model? What is our intuition telling us? All right, and so we were able to uh, estimate a phylogeny, but there's some stuff about this that's intrinsically unsatisfying. So I mentioned earlier that we could have an early burst model that manifests in either the clock or the tree model. What if those interact? Are these subsets independent and is it valid to do model selection on each of them? And my answer is a little bit no. Uh, and so my lab has been piloting what we call reversible jump model selection. This allows us to sample the number of model parameters as part of a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis. And so in this case, we could have uh, subsets of models um, being selected at once. So we could be doing the model fitting for each of our submodels together rather than separately. Uh, so we can sample models simultaneously to determine the correct model for all of the sections together. And finally, the other technique that my lab has been piloting is uh, the posterior predictive model adequacy testing. These are a family of methods that allow us to simulate data from our Bayesian posterior predictive or our Bayesian uh, posterior distribution, and then see if when we simulate those data, they look like the empirical data. And if they do, we have some test statistics to describe the goodness of fit there. And they're assumed that then the model is sort of adequate for the data. I'm running out of time. So uh, I'm just gonna sum this up really quickly. 
Uh, with these new hierarchical statistical models, we have non-independence of model subsections that could be misleading for our analyses. And so we're kind of looking at evaluating a new generation of tools for their effectiveness for dealing with these sorts of problems. All right, so thank you to all of these um, Right Lab members and collaborators, as well as to funders. And I think I'm out of time. Well, not quite. You actually have a few more minutes. We have about 10 minutes we can fill up. So we're going to ask you some on the spot questions here. Are right. you ready? Yeah. All right. You can good quit stop sharing your screen there if you would. And yeah. uh, that way we can uh, be just there you go. Now we can see you. So uh, a question from uh, chat and stuff. You mentioned that you are not working with genomic data. That was at least what was understood. How do you validate that model predictions or how important or even possible it is to validate the models? Yeah, so we work with a lot of simulated data in the lab uh, and try to simulate data that looks uh, like, you know, the real data. Um, I mean, and that's exactly the same as you would do with genomics, right? Um, so we work with a lot of simulated data for model validation. And then um, we do quite a bit of sensitivity testing as well. So, um, you know, you run the model and then, you know, you take a look at how well it's kind of working with your data and you run it up with maybe some different assumptions and see how much of a difference that makes to your actual conclusion. Uh, and then the other thing that you can do for kind of model validation would be the posterior predictive model adequacy testing, uh, which is that very last thing that that I, I kind of uh, thought that I was out of time to discuss. But the idea with this is that you take samples out of your posterior distribution, simulate data with them, and then uh, you use test statistics to determine how closely the correspondence is between um, you know, the data that you've, you've simulated under your model and your empirical data, right? So if they look very similar according to your test statistics, then that's you know, a good sign that you're probably modeling the correct things. Okay. Well, thank you. What are the limitations of using hierarchical Bayesian models? I mean, I would say that the limitations are mostly sort of, actually, we had an annual reviews paper that came out on this last week. Um, but there are, there are lots of limitations. And a lot of those limitations are computational. Um, so when it comes to Bayesian methods, you know, we're really looking at the idea of you know, having these models converge to a stationary distribution where you can assess that you've drawn enough samples from the posterior to approximate it. Uh, that takes a long time in practice uh, for complex models. So there's a time sort of factor and then the computation time associated with that. Uh, it's very hard to do this type of work, for example, in the cloud. So if you don't have, you know, a server or an HPC unit, a lot of this isn't at this point kind of out of your reach. Um, it's not something that can effectively be done via a AWS or anything like that. Uh, so there's that, that's a big limitation. Uh, another limitation is sort of the, uh, the quality of information that you can come up with, right? So let's say you have, um, you know, genomic data, but there's no fossils in your group. Your ability to have any sort of resolution in the past is therefore extremely limited. And there are some groups where that's true. Fish, for example, are one where because of the nature of sort of the sedimentology and how they get deposited, it's pretty hard to tell when a fish is from. <laughs> uh, other soft-bodied organisms are, are also quite tricky. Um, but, you know, if you're working with something like disease biology, you often have a lot of extremely high certainty data because you know what day the patient came in and you sampled their flu strain, right? Uh, so in the biomedical realm, methods like this are often extremely effective. Um, and actually, one of the founders of this kind of series of methods uh, was on Swiss national TV every week for the coronavirus update because they were the ones who were tracking it. Um, so you encounter a lot less limitations when you're looking over the short time scales, like a couple hundred years or a couple thousand years for a disease bearing organism. I think the other big limitation is just your ability to think about all of these things at once. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated. Uh, it really is. And developing the statistical literacy, the computational literacy, knowing each of your data sources and its individual limitations, that's a lot to ask of anyone. Uh, so I think, yeah, just our ability with human brains to think about these things is, is I think considerable. That's been my greatest, 
been my greatest impression over the last two days is just how everybody's keeping all this even remotely close to what they can think of. Okay, here we got one from uh, chat. Can the models be used to determine gene evolution for potential vaccine candidates for tick species? I mean, I don't see why not. Um, so for a long time, phylogenetics has been, has been a component of um, the flu vaccine uh, selection, right? And so uh, this is initially described back in the early aughts with uh, Mike Warby at all, where they would show that, you know, you would get oftentimes kind of a trunk lineage that would give rise to the flu strains for that year. Uh, and so phylogenetics has a deep kind of um, history with that. And they typically do that based on a couple of loci associated with sort of the uh, host genome evasion um, response. And so, uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think that sort of thing is, is very possible. So um, you can build individual gene phylogenies and see what they're telling you that might be different than the whole kind of species tree. Uh, so oftentimes there's conflict between what individual genes will tell you versus when you look at them all together, what they'll tell you. Um, but those techniques are very well explored. Uh, and so I think that would absolutely be possible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What are the ways you can combine hierarchical Bayesian trees with other methods like your standard neighbor joining tree, et cetera? You can't. Here we go. That was a simple answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't normally like to give answers that simple, but um, yeah, doesn't work with neighbor joining. Okay. Here's another one from chat. Have they used K nearest neighbor models against real data for synthesizing data? Has this included both clinical and omics data, om omics data? For example, using Cynthia patient data with 1KG genome data or using UK biobank data with clinical phenotypes, et cetera? I have never heard of any of that. So you and me both. So we're <laughs> potentially someone else. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, if it has limitations, then what is the biggest motivation to use it? Well, I mean, everything has limitations. Right. I mean, if, if we didn't do things that had limitations, you know, you wouldn't have a computer, right? Like, um, <laughs> uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this Curving meeting. Curving in uh, stone would make this very interesting, right? Right, okay, So exactly. what prompted you to focus, what prompted you to focus on this specific topic of research and did you consider other domains also? Why did you get this direction? Yeah, so for me, um, you know, I think like most kids, I grew up watching, you know, dinosaur TV shows and reading books about dinosaurs. And you think you might want to be a paleontologist, but, um, you know, that's that's a pretty tough career path. Um, whereas going into the computational side of things, you know, you get to do a lot of different things. Um in a day. And so, you know, when I was first thinking about, you know, evolutionary biology seriously as a career path, um, you know, I looked at lots of different things, you know, functional trait studies, um, you know, eco kind of evolutionary ecological studies, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but then as I started to think about kind of, well, how do we integrate those things together? Uh, you know, phylogenetics kind of kept coming up as sort of the organizing framework in which we study the evolution of traits and organisms. And so I got interested in phylogenetics that way. And then, you know, the statistical problems that we have uh, in phylogenetics are extremely difficult uh, and hard problems keep us in jobs and hard problems are interesting. And so <laughs> that's how I ended up here. Nice. Well, we're within a minute of, of our official closing time. So instead of potentially starting another question that we can't answer and, and working into uh, Manuel's time, I'm just going to thank you for a fascinating, interesting uh, decision making, modeling, and, and how it all relates. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.